planning about the next phase, the next foot of sea lawyers, the next two feet of sea lawyers, has to start right now. It has to start right now because uh, it is, again, it's gradual, and if you wait for things to happen, it might be too late. What people do know and don't know is, is hard to say. Um, you know, I get frustrated when I get calls from homeowners that may have just purchased a house along the shore, and they purchased it on days like this, and then they're here in March, and the water level is, is covering the beach and waves are crashing on the dunes. So they may not be com at all familiar with how nasty things can get in the ocean environment. So it is frustrating when they didn't seem to understand the risks of living along the shoreline. Um, when people say, I've lived here you know, 75 years and that my house has never been hit by whatever, well, that's good for you. That's lucky. You know, a hundred year storm doesn't mean <laughs> that in a hundred years you're going to get one. It means you every year you have a 1% chance of it might happening. And we haven't had a hundred year storm here in a very long time. So people really haven't seen what the full wrath of a storm of that magnitude will be. It's going to, I think, wake people up. I think one of the things that people probably know is that the glaciers formed Cape Cod, right? About 20,000 years ago, they started to recede and they started to melt. And that's why we have that shape of Cape Cod. Uh, and then the sea level started to rise as the glaciers were melting. About 6,000, 4,000 years ago, the sea level rose enough to start to interact with Cape Cod as we know it now. Uh, and it's been rising ever since. Chatham is probably more vulnerable than other, you know, communities along this portion of the Cape um, and along Nantucket Sound, frankly, um, because, you know, the mainland portion was kind of developed by nature while there's been an outer beach and, an, and a barrier beach system. So when that barrier is intact, you know, we're pretty safe back here. What is different for Chatham is that that barrier, as I just kind of explained, changes a lot. And for many decades, there'll be a very wide beach out in front of us, and then there'll be a period where there's no beach there. And when there's no beach there, these portions of shoreline are going to have a lot of vulnerability. So it's really unique to have this Nauset barrier beach system go through all these changes as readily as it does, and all those changes on the beach system impact the Chatham mainland. Other communities just don't have that same kind of a dynamic outer beach that is either there or not there. The reality is not one I have to explain. The reality is, is one that we all have to deal with. The water's coming, so we all get to decide what's gonna happen next. If you have a house right on the water, you're gonna have to decide what you're gonna do next. As a community, we have to decide what we're willing to pay for, um, and we have to figure that out. But the water's coming, and what you can do is you can build a wall. You can absolutely build a wall. You can get a permit and all the other things, but what you'll do is you'll lose the beach. The offshore sea levels are kind of making these beach morphological changes happen more frequently. We believe that in all likelihood, if storms are in fact you know, more severe, they seem to be more frequent perhaps, um, if that is in fact indicative of sea level and climate change, which we're led to believe according to science it may well be, that translates into an exacerbation of changes along the outer beach. So even though that beach across from us right now exists, it's really an island between the two inlets, that's deteriorating and will start to fall apart. So the recent uh, changes in sea level are, are obvious um, and uh, well documented. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, sea level was rising about one and a half millimeters per year, so about the thickness of a penny. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, it's doubled, right, to about three and a half millimeters per year. Now that's two pennies, the thickness of two pennies, and that doesn't sound like much, 
but it's, it's risen over a foot in New England, say, um, over the last 100 years. That's a lot. The thing to remember about sea level rise is that it's going to be most obvious during a storm event or during what we call these king tides, right? These really high astronomical tides. That's when you're gonna see the effects. Uh, a millimeter a year, three millimeters a year, you're not gonna see that, you're not gonna notice that. It's going to happen when you have these large events. That's when the effects of sea level rise are gonna be most clearly seen. We were not expecting this break here. Um, April 2007, so we call it the Patriot's Day storm, it happened on Patriot's Day of 2007. It was a very minor breach in the system initially, and we frankly thought it would probably fill in. It didn't. Um, and it very quickly turned into now the dominant inland forward Pleasant Bay system. So this is a cycle that we knew about. Um, exactly where things would go, you know, is always a guesswork. Um, but I think as far as the general, you know, concept, we get it, that that inlet's gonna move. We need to plan about what to do along the mainland shoreline, and to some extent, we are. Every year, multiple times a year, nor'easters. Um, the, the storm of record for Massachusetts used to be the blizzard of 1978. Now it's the storm from January 4th, 2018. Uh, that storm was a massive storm and affected most of Cape, uh, Cape well, affected all of Cape Cod and most of New England. The changes along the shoreline, both the mainland as well as our outer beach, is something that I deal with all the time. Um, our dredging needs in Chatham are substantial and we consistently try to use the opportunity for dredging to actually put that sand on the beach to also deal with ongoing erosion and so forth. And this inlet will very likely, as it has in the past, start migrating south. And as it moves, it's going to expose the shoreline to open ocean energy, you know, along this portion of shoreline. And sea level rise and climate change will probably accelerate that process. The way uh, town managers are going to deal with this and leaders um, is important, but they already are. Remember, uh, Sandwich just moved their fire department and their police department away from a very low-lying area, wherein during any kind of decent kind of storm, they would get the back, sort of the back parking lot would get flooded in those buildings. So um, there are options. There's, there's, um, there's all different ways of addressing it, and people are really trying different innovative ways of doing it. Massachusetts is, is, pretty, is pretty good, actually, at not only thinking about these things, but funding ideas. Um, so, but conversations have to be had now, and plans have to be thought about, and, and priorities have to be set. Because people want to live by the coast, they're always gonna to want to live by the coast. It's very expensive real estate. You know, buying property out is very controversial. Um, it's going to take a lot of money. Um, so again, whether or not this shoreline that we're sitting here will be here in 100 years, I don't know. I don't know. It will be different. Will it be gone or receded and the shoreline will now be inland? I don't think uh, 200 years ago that might have been the case. But now with technology and people's you know, abilities, I think people are going to try to do whatever they can to hold a line. And I think there has to be more collective effort. I mean, we're at the center here, we're working on a project where we're having the four Outer Cape Towns, Provincetown, Truro, Wellfleet, and East Ham, uh, try and figure out a way to uh, sort of an intermunicipal shoreline management uh, framework that we're trying to figure out. Uh, we forget about the political boundaries and we try and understand what's the best way to manage this shoreline and forget about that there's four different towns. Like if it was one town, how would we manage it? Um, and it's things like, it's ideas like that that really help people think about these things in a different way. Trying to mitigate, you know, town efforts to mitigate these problems, you know, 
A, we can only do, quote, so much. Much of the shoreline is private shoreline. So we just can't go in and just do whatever we think is the right thing on, on private lands for obvious reasons. The projects that I've been describing, you know, for dredging and then using that sand in a beneficial manner, that's something we do, you know, again, all the time. Not only on this side of the shoreline, but Nantucket Sound and so forth. It's just a matter of how vulnerable are those places and what needs to be done to address them. That, that spot that flooded during um, the January 2018 storm in Provincetown, the town is actively trying to build a dune right in front of there. There's a beach right there. The water washed right over the beach. So the town is actually trying to build a dune there, a natural dune, which is a wonderful solution, right? It's a natural solution to a, to a flooding problem. That, that's a great idea. In a sense, no matter what you do, there's going to be impacts. I mean, it just, you, you live on the coast, we are vulnerable living on a coast. Uh, even if you don't have direct, you know, wave attack, there's a lot of wind in a big storm. So I am concerned we're going to have a big event. People won't be ready in whatever that may translate, and there's going to be a lot of damage. Um, we have done studies to look at the likely changes in the Souter system. We just completed a coastal zone management, uh, coastal resiliency grant a couple years ago, looking at essentially our whole eastern seaboard, kind of to predict what some of the issues might be. Um, it came up with some recommendations, some of which we're seriously considering, others not yet because we haven't reached that point. You know, that information is available to homeowners so that they can also see, you know, some of the vulnerabilities that they may be, you know, experiencing that they may not be familiar with. So, again, we can kind of help the system. Uh, Mother Nature is going to do what she wants. And, you know, we're not, frankly, able to do things that are just going to make the problem go away. You know, that, it, it, what people can do to offset sea level rise and so forth is, you know, the, the, there's lots of things people can do, even if you don't live on the coast. The whole concept of trying to reduce your carbon footprint, all of those things, which are minor, but collectively they're important. Um, for coastal landowners, I think foremost is to be familiar with the vulnerabilities of living along the coast. Um, it's important to have eyes wide open and not be surprised if things change. The nature of the living on the coast is that change is normal. Uh, it's required in many ways. So be aware that the coast changes. It has to change, it needs to change. Um, don't, as I'm staring at a bunch of dinghies here, don't put your dinghies in the beach grass and kill the grass. The grass is important. People don't necessarily notice that <laughs> um, but I guess I, really knowing um, your environment what the science if you will is about what the change is because as I described in Chatham we have a lot of change it's a, it's a normal um, really be familiar with what could happen and talk to consultants about what your options are uh, depending on where you were located, the coastal bank, coastal dune, are all strong, different regulatory you know, requirements about what you can and can't do. Um, so anyway, I think just being informed is one of the best things that you know, people can be. If there are towns out there that aren't having these conversations now, they're, they're behind. Um, people have to think about what they're going to do. There have to be plans in place about what we're going to do.